Now, uh, that was a pretty long passage. Uh, I would be surprised if you didn't take a cup of coffee after that. Uh, but uh, have you noticed, by the way, okay, now in the, in the previous passage, in the previous video, uh, where we talked about the stage of small tranquility, Confucius mentioned a number of different relations. He talked about the relationship between ruler and subordinates, uh, between parents and children, right? Between siblings, between husband and wife. Uh, Confucius also mentioned five moral constants in, in the passage, uh, which are benevolence, justice, and I think uh, rights, which is propriety, okay, and wisdom and sincerity. Now, we'll, we'll discuss them in, in, in more detail uh, later on. But uh, the point is, the great similarity is not a uh, utopia. Okay, it was realized during the time of Yao and Shun. Uh, the Zhou dynasty went downhill from its middle, uh, middle period and, and changed from the great similarity to small tranquility. So this is how the passage was, you know, is arranged. Confucius praised the ancient times, as you can see, and he was yearning. He was yearning for the great similarity, uh, or we call it extreme peace stage, right? He was yearning for the uh, the great similarity, uh, uh, which was achieved by the sages' uh, ruler. But the question is, why would the, the above relations and moral constant only mention in the small tranquility and not, not the great similarity? He didn't mention any of those relations or, 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 or moral, uh, well, uh, uh, moral constants in the extreme peace stage or great similarity, right? Why? Well, in the great similarity, okay, people only have love. And they are self uh, selfless, absolutely selfless. People from all classes and groups know about helping others and serving others. That is extreme peace. There's no need to mention anything about the correct human relation and the morality because people would have uh, uh, returned to their innate goodness and innate nature. In advancing peace stage, which is small tranquility, however, people think of themselves. Well, they do think of others, but also think of themselves. Therefore, there is a need to, to remind people about the proper human relation and uh, morality. The Venerable Master Ching Kong mentioned in his uh, lectures that this small tranquility was, was relatively maintained for 2,500 years since Confucius' time till it, it, the, the late Qing dynasty, uh, where you know, social disorder appeared. Now, of course, uh, there has been regional wars and disorder from time to time in the history, but, but it has never been as chaotic as it is now. So although uh, the society seems peaceful, we just haven't looked closely enough. And what is, I think we can say that what is hidden behind, you know, seemingly prosperous economic and technological advancement is the, uh, the, the ever-growing inequality, divided society, financial market disruption uh, with increasing, you know, destructive power and frequency. This is all over the place. Now, on the top of that, of course, is a loss of filial piety between children and parents, uh, diminishing harmony between husband and wife, between brothers, sisters, friends. I think only a blind person would say that there is no such problem. Well, the question is, can we re return to the small tranquility or even the great similarity? But it's, I think it's up to us. It's up to the people. It's up to us. Now, the reason that humans are, are different from animals is that I think, you know, human can be taught and become good. So all of the Confucius teachings, you know, aim to direct people toward their uh, original inner goodness, 
And if, if you examine the, the governance of the sages ruler in the history of mankind, you may find that in making economic policies, they all considered the consequential impact on human nature development. In economics, there is a word for it, externality, and you, you may know it, right? And because it refers to the, uh, to the cost or benefit that, that affects the party who, uh, I think it says, didn't choose to incur that cost or benefit. So that's what externality means. Things like uh, pollutions and uh, systematic risk, okay, which is brought by the banking systems risk-taking, are just a few examples of negative externality. But the true externality is much broader than that. For example, uh, the sole emphasis on let's say free competition, leads to focus on quantitative economic indicators, and, and this leads to the diminishing importance of qualitative indicators such as morality. At least, at least, we don't say it's not mentioned at all, but at least there is very little mentioning of these factors in the mainstream economic and financial research. So fusing economic policymaking with, with a human nature development and and traditional culture is absolutely crucial to the better life of human, uh, of mankind. So this is the purpose of this lecture series.